Hello. Coming up, we explore business partner supply chain risk and provide you definitions to frame the discussion, relevant risks today, and a recap of action plans you can take action on now. Coming from the sunny Midwest, I'm Audrey Catcher, and these are just some of the topics we'll be exploring in this January's monthly technology advisory. Welcome to the Go Beyond Disruption podcast, brought to you by the Association of International Certified Professional Accountants, the unified voice of the AICPA and CIMA. Every week, you'll get insights from inside the accounting and finance profession that help you stay ahead of the curve, whatever your business, wherever you're based. In the hosting seat this week, I'm Audrey Catcher from Ruben Brown, and I'm based in St. Louis, serving clients nationally. Our topic this week is business partner supply chain risk, and joining me to explore it are Torpy from Whipfly in Philly and Mardani, or Danny, from Celestia in Toronto, Canada. Their links to their profiles are shown in the show notes. Welcome to both of you. Before we get into the discussion, I'll ask each of you, Torpy and Danny, to tell us something about yourself. Where are you based? Something about the kind of work you do? Or why today's topic is particularly important? So with that, maybe Torpy, you can go first. Thanks, Audrey. And it's good to hear from you and join this podcast. So as you mentioned, my name is Torpy White. I'm a partner at Wifley based in Philadelphia. My specialty is SOC audits, but I do a lot of IT audits as well and have been doing that for the better part of 30 years. Love what I do. And today's topic is really relevant because there's so many organizations that are part of a business partner supply chain that the risks they present to any other customers of theirs or even within their own organization they need to be cognizant of where those breakdowns and obstacles are present so that they can start to mitigate and manage those risks. Thank you. And Danny? Thank you uh, for having me today. I'm based in Toronto, in Canada, and I work in a company called Celestica. Uh, It's also based in Toronto. I've been working on the IT uh, department, so basically doing projects uh, related to the software implementation. And basically, I'm doing the um, the accounting module, integrating with the other SCM uh, modules in the ERP software. Um, ERP stands for the Enterprise Resource Planning Software. We are going to be talking about the supply chain, the risks, and it's also something that's related to the financial side of it, uh, and also from the IT perspective. Thank you so much. And I'm Audrey Catcher. I help clients prepare for and report to their third parties in this supply chain, whether it's related to their controls, their procedures, um, from financial reporting to security to the supply chain space. This is a very important space today, as we've all seen through the recent months of the pandemic. With that, I wanted to get a baseline discussion started, and we want to go through some of the different areas of supply chain management. Then we'll go into some of the risks and give you some of the real stories of what we've been seeing. And then we'll have a recap on some action items for you and some takeaways. Also in the show notes will be some reference material for you as well. So with the different areas of supply chain management, Torpy, did you want to discuss some of the main areas that we're going to consider from manufacturing, producers, distributors, and service providers? Absolutely. Those three categories of organizations, industries, however you like to frame that, are so interrelated that it's hard to pull them apart, but they are very distinct in their own right and present different challenges within those particular industries. Manufacturers, you think of a traditional organization that brings in raw materials, um, re constitutes and puts things together and produces some finished product. Well, along that continuum of the business process, there's many things that could go wrong through uh, a lack of raw materials coming in at the right time to a machine breaking down or not receiving the the proper instructions to a finished good that does not get shipped on time or is shipped and 
runs into a uh, an obstacle somewhere along the path to the ultimate customer ties right into the producers. Uh, a producer could pick up a piece of that supply chain and be adding something that the manufacturer does not normally do or coding something or providing some other piece of the puzzle to a finished good and also have those same challenges with regard to their raw materials or their vendors that may not be able to meet their timeline for whatever reason. It could be a worldwide event. It could be a local event, but it is something that they should start to look at and where are those risks and challenges in their supply chain. And then finally, the distributors. They're normally the receiver of those finished goods waiting to be either aggregated and shipped out to a local um, location, or they are just a waypoint in between um, truck stops along the way to somebody's final destination. So they can certainly have an impact on that supply chain and have trouble with logistics, have trouble with getting trucks in and out at, on time. Weather-related issues can certainly have an impact there. So one of the things that we saw in 2020 was not only the pandemic hitting the human element of people and where they work, but all of a sudden, now the demand for certain goods went through the roof because people were working in a different location than they typically had been. And everyone or the, every organization along that continuum, manufacturer, producers, and distributors, had to readjust and really react quickly to that demand. So it's something that as providers, professionals, accountants, either inside or outside of an organization, we need to always be looking at that vendor supply chain and wondering, is there a potential breakdown waiting to happen that we should be looking at? And where are those risks? So with that, Torby, what about a service provider? How do they play into the supply chain? I know we were looking at some service providers and we were seeing how they were running into issues because they had employees who were unexpectedly out for long periods of time due to having COVID-19 or some other uh, situation. But what else about a service provider needs to be defined here? I think service providers don't normally come top of mind to people when they're thinking about supply chain. Service providers, whether it's us as professional accountants, lawyers, architects, bankers, are really integral to the supply chain because we are providing information to a lot of different organizations and we're doing that in different ways and we're reliant on a lot of other parties to do their part. Something as simple as our employees not being able to access their VPN to log into the network to be able to do their work can be a disruption in the supply chain that sometimes we don't think of. And having something <laughs> as simple as time of day restrictions on when somebody can log into the network and perform their work could have a disruption in the supply chain. So when you think about supply chain, you, you need to expand your horizon beyond just the goods that might hit your kitchen table or your office chair. It's the services as well. Right. So another type of service provider could be the data center that's hosting the information, the cable service provider, internet service provider for everybody to do everything working from home. All those things we often think about in infrastructure. Danny, switching over to you with the software developers and financial, who are they in a supply chain definition? Yeah, Audrey, from the software development perspective, right? It starts from the uh, the business analyst, right? We have the business analyst, uh, we have the functional analyst, right? So first, we have to look at the uh, the definition of the requirements, right? Um, with respect to supply chain, right now, a lot of uh, things are focused on the SEM side, basically from the supply chain, uh, from what we call the production planning, right? Our our materials procurement. And then um, our sales, right? 
And one of the things that we as the um, service providers or the IT, let's say the developers, uh, we have to look also right now in this thing called the financial supply chain to make sure that uh, not only from the perspective of the physical flow of the goods, but we also have to think about the exchange of information. Um, how can we automate some processes to make sure that there is a smoother flow of uh, the information in order to make sure that um, the flow of funds, let's say, you know, the payments, because nowadays we're all talking about the cash flow. So we're trying to help to make sure that um, the processes can be uh, working in a faster way. Uh, in a way that it's it's not something that has to be performed by people. Try to automate stuff if possible in the background. Torpy, now we're going to get to the risks and some of the concepts to mitigate those risks and some real life stories. So this will be the fun part before we get into the action items. Absolutely. And back to my previous reference to thinking of the supply chain as only those manufacturers and producers. And to your point about professional services, where do those risks present themselves and why do we need to think about them? I have a great example of a client that I was working with that used an outsourced data center to provide their backup of data and applications. And the IT director for our client was on medical leave. And during that time when he was on medical leave, the company got a notice from that outsourced backup provider that they were going to be shutting their doors in two weeks. And any organization that had data in that backup provider needed to get it out within those two weeks. Well, the IT director, because he was on medical leave, he was the only one that monitored and managed the backups, didn't receive the notice until after he came back from his medical leave, and it was too late. The two weeks had already elapsed, and their data was not retrievable and lost. What could have been done? Well, one is that somebody else could have been serving in his backup role, and two, we think of just the initial signing of a vendor. They're performing whatever service they're performing, but we don't do a good job of monitoring what's going on with our vendors. Are they in the news, positive or negative? Are things happening with them that we should be aware of? Doing something as simple as putting a Google alert on for those vendors that you use that are tiered as maybe your critical vendors or your if you're using a one, two, three, four, five uh, platform to to rank them, the the top vendors that fit category one, two, and three are the ones that you put those Google alerts on, will help you monitor whether there's anything that is amiss or is really good happening at your vendor that you want to monitor. So it really is uh, very critical. And, and obviously, if you're monitoring a, a manufacturer, a distributor, or a producer, you can do the same thing, but don't forget about those service providers. Thank you. That was a great example. I think Danny has another one he's ready to discuss for us. Yeah. So just to add on on what uh, Torpy mentioned, being service providers here, that we are, we are IT people, but we, we are also accountants, right, uh, from training perspective and background. So um, we have to know about this thing called the Sarbanes-Oxley, right? The SOX compliance. So when we're talking about this uh, flow of exchange of information, we, we have to uh, be compliance of what we call the internal controls, specifically like SOX actions, right? Like 302, 404, and 409, right? It's all talking about the internal controls, uh, who can log in, the account activities, and when we have what we call the exchange of information, we have to see who has access to that, uh, let's say, a portal, not just from our side as a company, but also from our business partners. We have what we call the vendors, we have our customers, right? So in the automation perspective, um, we also have to make sure, right, who has access internally and externally as well. Yeah, I think what you're getting to there is the management of the risk that could affect our business, disrupt our supply chain. So 
If we've outsourced, we're the entity, and if we've outsourced something, we have not outsourced the responsibility. Our responsibility is to check on that entity. For for example, and what's the change control on their software before they send me a patch? <laughs> Who can change that software before they send it to me to patch? We have a responsibility to understand the controls at those third and fourth parties before we are taking it into our environment, which could disrupt our business. On the flip side of that in the supply chain, we have the responsibility to check the, the not just ones who are given us something to ingest, whether it's a product or software or whatever, but also check on those other ones that could be a fourth level, fifth level provider in that chain that could disrupt the whole channel. Um, I think when we get into our action items, we're going to talk about how do you put a vendor management program in place that considers your backup plans and the risks in each of these areas that we've discussed? Here's where you're going to take some notes, people. Uh, so take down some notes on your, some of your key takeaways. So there are three things we wanted to hit on today. One to hit on setting up a vendor management program, um, contracting to help manage the risk and set those expectations, and then validating the business partners regularly. And I should add to that the environment. Um, so making sure you've got plan B in place um, for those high risk outage items. Let's just leave it at that. So starting with the vendor management program, Torpy, how would you advise, what are the actions people should take at this time? I think there's a few items that should be priority one. First is determine whether your organization has a vendor management program. It may not be called the vendor management program. It may have some other nomenclature within your organization, but there should be somewhere that vendors are being looked at. It sometimes sits in the legal area. Sometimes it sits in a compliance area. Sometimes it sits in the accounting function or IT. You're exactly right. It, it can certainly sometimes sit in IT finding out what that program looks like and whether it even exists is your first priority. Next would be to find out how well is it managed? Is someone within the organization, and maybe it's not their full-time job, but some is someone making sure that those vendors are being managed and managed is monitored, ranked, uh, determined whether they are so critical to the organization that if they failed, you would have a shutdown. And what is the frequency of that regular monitoring and managing? Those are the are really the key components of having a, a pretty decent vendor management program. I'll let Danny take the next piece, but really, if nothing else you you take out of this podcast, it's go find out what your vendor management program looks like. Yes, Toby, uh, you're absolutely correct on that one. From the vendor management, right? I think um, we we uh, first we have to talk about how do we uh, select the vendors, right? Basically, it's it's gonna fall on the supply chain, meaning the business people who are going to assess the vendors. Uh, now, having said that, let's say um, after the vendors have been evaluated and you know invited to become a vendor for us or supplier. So then we have to update their information to our system. We have to have someone who, because of the segregation of duty, right? Uh, we want to make sure there is uh, uh, someone who is responsible, accountable to create or to to uh, maintain, right? Or make changes on that vendor information. Especially um, when we talk about vendor, uh, there is banking information. After we do the procurement, where should we transfer or wire the money to, right? Who, who should be receiving the money, right? Uh, the payment. So we want to make sure that confidential piece of information is not going to be easily accessible by the IT people or even by the, the business people. And then um, from that perspective, uh, we know that nowadays we have a lot of scams, right? People just asking, hey, I have a new bank account, right? So we want to make sure that it gets verified and re-verified emails or phone calls to make sure it is the proper and accurate banking information. That's one of the example in terms of the vendor management. And then we have to look at it again. The next one is the contract, right? The expectation between us and our uh, vendor. What kind of, of service level agreement we have here? Because we want to make sure that they comply with it and we'll all level set the expectations. 
from there we have to look at how do we we reassess again if there are some changes in 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 the whole um, the whole expectations and then uh, looking at the other area let's say uh, um, when we make any changes in our IT applications then there has to be what we call the UAT right the user acceptance test meaning that um, everything has to be tested properly like going back to what Audrey mentioned if someone from IT put in a patch and then it affects her laptop or computer right uh, that she's using it for work it has to pass the UAT, UAT stage right user acceptance test uh, before it uh, it goes distributed in into the real laptop or, or production system that's kind of things that we, we call it as part of the risk management right from the IT perspective yes thank you Danny when you're finding out about your program or you're setting it up making sure you've uh, taken an understanding from what Torpy and Danny have highlighted. And then also considering the SOC for Supply Chain Framework and the description criteria, that's an input for some of the risk areas to consider. Um, it's a framework, so you can work it into what's best for your environment. Successful vendor management programs will have appropriate leadership and ownership, meaning that they have someone who will be listen to in the company to assess and monitor these vendors, as Danny and Torpy suggested. And then the regular reporting out on those risk-based lists and analyses of the various vendors and business partners. I'll close with some of the contracting to manage the risk and setting the expectations on the responsibilities through the supply chain is always important. That's probably an area companies have done a little bit more on or they've updated recently and then validating them regularly, like we've said many times. So there are some frameworks out there. So that I think that SOC for supply chain is a good one to consider as an example to help you look at this program if you're looking at it independently or if you're a part of the program, maybe places for enhancement. Any other closing comments, Torpy or Danny? I would concur that the SOC for Supply Chain Framework is a great place to start. And there's links at the end of the presentation to get to that so that you as an organization can start to look at, all right, well, do we have a risk assessment process in place for our vendors? How are we managing those risks? How are we identifying those? And how are we making sure that we're following up on them and not just doing it once and, and setting it aside forever? I think for any organization that really pays attention to their vendors, they're going to be on top of any kind of issue long before their competitors are because they're actively managing it and being somewhat proactive rather than reactive. So great reference for those of you listening. And uh, it's a terrific way to start looking at an in objective point of view for your vendor management program. And that's it for this month's Technology Advisory Edition for the Go Beyond Disruption podcast. Thanks to my insightful co-presenters, Torpy and Danny. Uh, if you'd like to connect with them, we'll put their profile information and links into your show notes. To view those notes, just tap on this episode, hit the info icon in the podcast app on your smartphone or your tablet. From the sunny Midwest, I'm Audrey Catcher. Till next time, keep listening and keep safe. And goodbye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Beyond Disruption, brought to you by the Association of International Certified Professional Accountants. Learn more about today's topic at AICPA-CIMA.com forward slash disruption. This podcast is designed to provide illustrative information with respect to the subject matter covered and does not represent an official opinion or position of the Association of International Certified Professional Accountants or any of its subsidiaries or affiliates. It is provided with the understanding that the association, its affiliates, and subsidiaries are not engaged in rendering legal, accounting, or other professional services. If such advice or expert assistance is required, the services of a competent professional person should be sought. The association, its subsidiaries and affiliates make no representations, warranties, or guarantees as to and assume no responsibility for the content or application of the material contained herein and expressly disclaim all liability for such damages arising out of the use of, reference to, or reliance on such material.